How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. As CEO of PG&E, Patty Poppy is charged with navigating the company through massive wildfires, disrupted energy markets, and lingering public distrust. The utility suffers from a string of self-imposed disasters, the explosion of a company gas line in San Bruno that killed eight people, and the failure of PG&E equipment that caused a rash of deadly wildfires, Butte, Camp, Kincaid, and Dixie, killing 91 people and burning nearly 1.5 million acres. The company's 2019 bankruptcy was the largest ever for a U.S. utility. Now the company is undergrounding 10,000 miles of electric lines. It's working with GM and Ford on tapping EVs to power homes and deploying batteries at large power plants. It's also pushing to change net metering rates that pay homeowners for electricity generated on their roofs. How will PG&E bounce back and help California to modernize its energy grid? We'll find out today on Climate One. We know that in 2016, PG&E was put on probation after being convicted for a fatal pipeline explosion. During that probationary period, the company equipment ignited fires that killed 91 people. That took place before you were at the helm of the company. But earlier this year, the judge overseeing PG&E's bankruptcy said the company, quote, has gone on a crime spree and will emerge from probation as a continuing menace to California. Crime spree and menace. Those are strong words from a federal judge who knows the company deeply. So, Patty Poppy, what are you doing to change one of the country's most prominent corporate criminals? I came to fix it. I looked on from afar. I was previously the utility CEO, a CEO of a utility in Michigan, uh, actually in my hometown. Uh, I thought I had achieved my professional dreams come true. I lived uh, on the street where I grew up. My dad had retired from that company. Um, and I was so proud to lead that team in that company. And I thought I was, uh, had fulfilled my professional ambitions. And um, then I kept receiving calls to come to PG&E. I think a lot of people in the industry know me as an operator and one who leads with equal parts heart and head. And uh, I actually think that's what's required for PG&E right now. And so from afar, uh, I watched the challenging situation, the accelerating climate change, the effects it was having on people's lives, the devastation that was caused. I was heartbroken when I observed and watched um, both the, the San Bruno uh, explosion and its after effects, and then uh, obviously the wildfires that have been so devastating here in California. And so I came to make it right and to make it safe. And uh, I can tell you that the team that I am so proud to lead at PG&E gets up every single day to do exactly that. Well, last year in the aftermath of the Dixie Fire, you pledged to underground 10,000 miles of power lines or about an eighth of the overhead lines in your system. How quickly will that happen and how much will it cost? One, we're, we're ramping the plan right now, and so it'll be less than 10 years. Every, somebody somehow jumped to a 10-year conclusion, but it will be less than 10 years. We're already uh, making progress on that. This year, to date, we've already buried more lines than we buried all last year. But it's only like, what, 100 or 200 miles this, a in year? In the early years, and so we're gonna ramp up to about 1,200 miles uh, a year uh, in the next four years. and. People ask about the cost all the time, and I want to frame up something, and, and Greg, I know you understand utility economics better than a lot of people, but it's a little complicated, but what I can tell you is today, what is expensive for customers is the fact that we spend $1.7 billion a year at PG&E trimming and removing trees from lines. That is an annual expense that our customers are bearing 
By undergrounding the lines, though there's an upfront capital cost, the long-term maintenance expense on that and the 99 plus percent risk reduction makes it a very economic choice. Uh, there's estimates of about $3 million per mile. I guess you're saying that's coming down. So that gets put into to your rate base, right? Capital structure. Mm -hmm. So that's also good for the business, right? Because then you get a return on that capital, whereas you don't get the same return on cutting trees. Well, and it's good for customers. That's who it's good for because it spreads the cost out over a longer time and they get a permanent repair. One of the challenges I've discovered at PG&E is our financial structure is much over the years, maybe it's because of the challenges the company has faced, but it drifted to a heavy expense um, percentage. The best of the best utilities in the nation are at about a two to one capital to expense ratio because those are better permanent repairs for customers. It's actually, the utility is designed to invest in infrastructure. PG&E is at about a 0.9, which means for every dollar of expense, only 90 cents goes to capital uh, infrastructure, which means we are band-aiding as a practice. You're not as investing. Opposed, we're not investing and people have said, PG&E didn't invest in the infrastructure. I agree, and we have to fix that. And so undergrounding actually becomes a very economic part of our reimagination of the grid. You've acknowledged that the company hasn't been you know, in touch with its customers. In 2020, nearly 5 million Americans received their electricity through a program called Community Choice Aggregation. These are local alternatives to mon monopoly utilities, and they exist in California, Illinois, New York, Ohio, and Virginia. They're actively being considered in Arizona, Colorado, and your former state, Michigan. The US EPA says that these local power companies provide potentially lower costs, faster shift to greener power, local control of electricity generation, and expanded consumer choice, green local choice. What's your view on these local competitors, really? Yeah, well, they're not necessarily competitors. They're part Partly. of the fabric of the way we deliver energy in California. And I do think um, the big change that's going to happen for utilities and for energy providers and for the grid uh, is an opportunity as we decarbonize the economy is to have our hometown utilities play a very important air traffic control if you will in the grid and we because we don't make profit on the sale of energy so a community choice aggregator doesn't actually affect our profitability. They're not competitors. They actually can be partners. And it might be better for us to deploy our dollars to the grid and allow those community choice aggregators, as we've supported, deliver energy in a different form. Now, I would argue that the energy that we do produce at PG&E is 93% GHG free, that which we delivered to customers last year. That might surprise people. In fact, some people... Um, well, many people have been surprised when they find out that the energy we deliver is 93% GHG free. But what I get excited about is imagining what that grid of the future is going to look like, and we need to make sure that we are investing in that. And so let me just give you an example. I know your family's from Michigan, Greg, and so maybe at one point or another you traveled along I-80 in Iowa. Uh, and so when you think about I-80 in Iowa, it's a long, straight, you know, thoroughfare with a few off ramps, a few on ramps. And that's a little bit like what the grid has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got one way flow of power from big bulk power stations onto that big super highway and off to some off ramps and then gets down to the little towns that surround the, the freeway. I imagine the grid of the future to look a lot, much, a lot more like downtown San Francisco. We're going to have multimodal energy forms, and we need all of it. We need all of it. We need all of the clean energy that we can muster. We need to find a way to deliver it with one very important caveat, that as we transition to a carbon-free economy and a carbon-free energy system, we do it in an optimized way. And until now, I think we've been doing it in a sub-optimized way, partly because energy companies like PG&E 
have been resistant to sort of share the space, we need to share the space. And as we share the space, we can reinvent and reimagine how we distribute energy in these multimodal forms, but we have to optimize it. It can't be uh, kind of a fixed pie mindset where there's winners and there's losers. We need all of it, but we can, there are ways to do it that are the lowest societal cost. And I get pretty excited when I think about kind of being air traffic control for new forms of energy, optimizing the forms that we have today and bringing the cleanest energy system to the people of California at the lowest cost. And we've, uh, our system has been to regulate those companies to be reliable and everywhere, not to be dynamic or entrepreneurial, like reliability, keep the lights on. That's like the base thing, not, yes. not to create new, new ways of delivering that energy. You know, PG&E is an investor owned utilities. You know, though so there's some questions now about whether investor owned utilities are the best sort of capital structure or model, right? You know, given that there's these other models out there, you know, what's the case for investor-owned utilities when there are some municipals and other ownership structures that have done pretty well serving their customers? Yeah, you know, I used to ask myself this very same question. You know, I spent the first 15 years of my career at General Motors in the automotive industry, and then I switched to the utility. So coming from a very hyper-competitive industry to a investor-owned utility. And I remember having to learn the finances and I, I kept having meetings with these regulatory finance guys. And I'm like, wait, tell me one more time. Doesn't revenue minus expense equal, equal profit? They're like, no, not here. It's a different <laughs> formula. So I really had to learn all that. And as I learned all of that, I realized that though we call them monopolies because we have a monopoly that's designated in a geographic area, we do compete for capital. Mm -hmm. And an investor-owned utility, one of the advantages to the customers of an investor-owned utility is the transparency of our performance relative to peers. So I can tell you, we have to fill out a FERC Form 1 that sells all of our costs, and our investors make choices about where to deploy capital based on the most effectively operated utilities. So for customers, there actually is a real gauge of our effectiveness, both from the customer perspective, but from an investor perspective as well. And I do have to just make one pitch for investors. I think sometimes we think investors, we imagine these fat cats on Wall Street, you know, raking in the dough at the expense of the little guy. Let me tell you who the utility investor is. It is a mom and pop it's probably all of the people who are here. Anybody who has a retirement fund is a utility investor. And utility investors do not expect profit maximization. Mm -hmm. They expect a steady, fair return and a good, safe dividend. And so from my perspective, that then does not put in conflict investors and customers. It actually puts them on the same side of the equation, both wanting the same outcome. That's well-served customers and a well-operated utility. And so for that reason, I think the investor-owned utility model has tons of advantages for the people that we serve. Some people who've been in California before you got here would say that PG&E cut corners to divert money to investors that didn't go to safety. And, and that was partly some regulatory uh, problems, but there were, you know, there's an incentive to cut corners on safety if you're shareholder driven. And this is where I think our new leadership team is probably gonna have the biggest impact at PG&E. When I went out to the market, so I was hired in, in um, November of 2020, and I started January 1st. Well, I spent from November 2020 to January 1st recruiting a management team. All of the positions, but for our general counsel and our, our chief financial officer were open, which ended up being a good thing. I didn't have to go through this evaluation phase. I could just bring in a great new team. And I was able to attract some of the top industry performers and industry leaders from the best, most well-run utilities in the nation. California, the people of California um, should be very grateful that these people came and have signed up for this challenge and this mission because we know what good looks like and what good looks like is customers are always first. There's never a trade-off between safety and profit. I can tell you 100% there is no contest 
safety is always first, the safety of my coworkers and the safety of our communities. And the management team at PG&E is committed to proving that and proving and earning the trust and proving ourselves trustworthy by the people of California that we are here to serve. We know what good looks like and we're about implementing all of the processes and systems to make PG&E the safest utility in the world. So I believe you, I wanna believe that you're, you're, you hired a great team. What happens when the, the next fire? If there, if there is, you know, odds are you got a lot of lines and a lot of forests that are hot and dry and there's a lot of fuel there. What happens then to the individuals that you're talking about and to the company? What, what happens next? Next time. Yeah, a couple things. First of all, there are a lot of positive signs about the progress we've already made. We uh, have taken some very significant actions in the last 18 months, one of which was implementing a system called an, uh, our Enhanced Power Line Safety Settings. We call it EPSS. We have activated these settings and engineered our power lines in all of our high fire threat areas in addition to that 10,000 additional miles adjacent to those high fire threat areas that if anything makes contact with those lines, they de-energize in less than a tenth of a second. And as a result, we've seen ignitions drop 80% year over year. And this year we're adding new technologies and new devices to get that 80 closer to 100. And that progress is real and it's happening. So that's thing one. But thing two, I'm gonna tell you just a little story. Um, one of our new board members, we replaced the entire board too in 2020, one of our new board members is uh, a four-star admiral, Mark Ferguson, who was the chief naval officer for the US Navy. One day when I was uh, coming to terms with risk and the hazards and the trauma that my coworkers have experienced and our customers have experienced, I called him. I just said, Mark, I need to know, how am I supposed to think about the risks that exist on this system? and the hazard of things going wrong. And he said two things to me that I will never forget and it really encouraged me. One was, he said, first Patty, you have to ask yourself, is it safer because you're there? I said, well, yes, that's, uh, that it is getting, it like, yes. And I know that our leadership team is making a huge difference for the people of California. And then he said, well, in that case, real leaders thrive in that environment. So I was like, oh, geez, okay, this is me thriving. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and then he said, Patty, every great mission, every great mission that was ever executed in the history of missions, and he said, you know, I have studied every military mission in the history of the world. He said, had two key fundamental attributes. One, they had setbacks. And two, they had leaders with resolve and they had leaders who were unwilling to give up the mission because there was a setback. You talk about leading with love, and where does that empathy come from, and where, where does it have a place in running a Fortune 500 company? <laughs> I think if more companies led with love, the world might just be a better place. Uh, companies can be a force for good, and uh, trust me, I get a few raised eyebrows uh, as I'm out in the field with my crews and at our power plants, and. People wonder, hey lady, what's with this love business? But let me tell you something. We, um, we need more human in the equation of the work that we do. And I think born out of the industrial revolution, there's a mindset that work is work and life is life. And I believe that people bring their life to their work whether they want to or not. And if we can acknowledge the human experience of people who are doing very mission critical, purpose driven work, then we have a much higher likelihood of achieving our ambitions. And, you know, we just had um, several retirements at the end of June. And look, when you say goodbye to your dear friends that you've worked shoulder to shoulder with to change the world together, you can't tell me that you don't love them. And so let's just acknowledge that and create a space for people to be human while we do what we do. And I think people are safer then to be themselves, to bring their best ideas, to make a difference that's gonna last and to hold each other accountable. We, we had a, a, a leadership team meeting uh, earlier this week 
and I was talking on the subject of leading with love, when you put your child in their back in the back seat of your car in their safety seat you buckle the seatbelt. you would never pull out of the driveway without buckling your child in because you love them when you're working on a job site with a co-worker and you see them doing something unsafe darn straight you're going to say something because you love them and when you acknowledge before something happens that there is love in this space then you're going to do better work and it's going to be safer for our communities and for our co-workers PG&E you know, has hydroelectric, it's pretty green relative to utilities in the country. Mm. We're in a situation where uh, there is a, 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 what are you doing to use your platform profile within the industry to decarbonize because there's still some clinging to coal that's happening. We're not gonna get much support from Congress or the Supreme Court right now. So it's kind of a moment where industry needs to lead and is industry gonna go faster than it absolutely has to. You know, you might be surprised about this. Um, my peers across the, the industry are extraordinarily committed to decarbonizing the energy resources. When I was in Michigan, and so here I was, Michigan Utility, I had total support to retire our coal plants. And we retired while I was there five, uh, or seven of our 12, we had five remaining. Those dates have been set. Um, the, the company made even more aggressive ambitions to retire the coal faster since I left. The, the ambitions of the, the sector are pretty extraordinary and the carbon reductions that have occurred in the nation have been predominantly driven by the transition away from coal in power generation. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, just a few years ago, in 2018, the carbon emissions from power generation exceeded that of transportation. That's not true anymore. The greatest reductions have been made in the power sector. So I think you would find a willing group of very ambitious leaders actively pursuing the decarbonization of our generating fleet nationwide. And those companies actually sat on the sidelines when there was this case, West Virginia versus EPA recently, um, where you know, one state and some Republican governors, uh, attorney generals, you know, brought this case. Industries kind of sat on the sidelines, which was- Oh, there were several of us who, uh, several of my peers and I supported the EPA's position. And, and frankly, the ship has sailed. It's already happening. Coal's dying. Coal is dying. The economics even changed. There's not a future for coal. So we've talked about the underinvestment in the grid and the need to modernize the grid. You know, the campfire that killed 80 people was started in part by a part that cost 56 cents in 1919. Uh, so what should be done to modernize the, the electric grid? You know, I... Um, stood at the base of that transmission tower and I looked at that sea hook. Actually, I was on a cliff that was near it so I could actually see it. I wasn't at the base. And it occurred to me that those power lines at one time, when they were originally imagined and installed, were a pathway to prosperity for the people uh, in our rural communities and across the globe, but particularly, obviously, in California and now they're a hazard. And as I stood there, I, you know, I thought about that sea hook and it felt like a needle in a haystack. Like, how do you find that? But we have systems, we have processes, but I learned a concept in lean manufacturing in my early professional years and as an industrial engineer, eliminate the hazard. And in that case, that means eliminate the line challenge the notion that we need every one of those lines and instead use new technologies. And so I imagine Henry or uh, Thomas Edison coming back today and frankly, he'd recognize most of the stuff. <laughs> it would be pretty familiar, sure. but not for long. And as we deploy distributed energy resources, microgrids, as we underground the power lines, as we have resilient, redundant power supply that's mobile, when we deploy the full potential of electric vehicles to not just use power from the grid, but put it back on the grid when we need it, flex alerts become a thing of the past, that we have a resilient, reliable energy system that is clean and affordable, we actually get to do that right now. We get to do something that is 
we're disrupting ourselves and it is so exciting. And you come from the auto industry. I think one of the biggest positive changes in the last 10 years is the auto industry really getting serious about electrification. So talk about the role of, of cars in that transformation of the grid. Yeah, I think they're essential. Um, in fact, we've, PG&E, this is part of the fun of being a, a California uh, company leader. The people want to do business in California. And so we've been able to sign an agreement or make agreements with both General Motors and Ford, and we were already doing work with BMW to provide bi-directional charging wherein the vehicle both powers the house and ultimately can power the grid. So I think a lot of people have heard about the Ford Lightning and Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, and I made a big announcement in Houston uh, last year, or in March uh, of this year, uh, that w the first Ford Lightnings would be plugged into the PG&E grid. And we're excited about that as a, I call it the triple stack of value, that it, certainly decarbonizing transportation is important, but imagine it as a resilience play powering your house, and then on a hot summer day, it powers the grid. That changes the value proposition of an electric vehicle, and it changes the role of the interface between the electric vehicle and our grid, and we get to reimagine that. We, in fact, um, are working with Microsoft and Schneider Electric to optimize the system that can accelerate the distributed energy resources being optimized. It is such an exciting time for customers to have solutions that they want, the power the way they want it, and in a way that when we do it in an optimized way, where we have one system and real architecture to how all of these distributed resources interface one another, we can have a m much lower societal cost to decarbonizing our economy. And I think that is, it's like the chance of a lifetime to have that kind of impact on the world and to lead the team who's going to lead California through that transition is pretty exciting. Let's give a round of thanks to Patty Poppy for coming here, doing a tough job and an important time. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate Thanks, Betty. Thanks, Betty.